Namaste and good evening to all of you. I'm glad to meet you either in presence or online for the new satsang from this week. I uh, received questions and I felt inspired to talk a little bit about the phenomenon of aspiration but in another way than we talk about it in the study of yama and niyama in yoga, not like discussing about the morals and ethics, the moral dimension of the human being, but more like uh, talking about why do yoga? Because not only that yoga is misunderstood today, and at least 90% of the people that talk about it deal with it like a form of fitness, like a form of gymnastics, and therefore, at the best, an exercise for getting healthy, an exercise for getting vitality. And as such, then why do yoga? Oh, I'm a total fan of fitness and holistic health. Yeah, that's a motivation some people can consider that their aspiration is in that. I remember that um, I told to people, and I have uh, written it even down here on my paper as idea, that, for example, when uh, Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist authors talk about the different practices of Tibetan yoga, they sometimes call it about grounds. And the grounds... <clears throat> they are a colorful English language translation to say that the ground of you doing meditation, so it's basically the motivation, it's the why. What will it give to you? What do you hope it will give to you? How will it reward you in one way or another? And um, that's why I felt that um, for the person who is looking from the outside, it's more clear for the insiders, anyone who has been for a couple of years in yoga, they probably know why they do what they do. And uh, the experience shows to them if indeed that motivation works or not. Because if you find yourself being in yoga theoretically and actually not doing yoga, whatever, physical yoga, mental yoga, spiritual yoga, affectionate yoga, emotional yoga, devotional yoga, what sort, even selfless service type of yoga, if you are not into it, then it's a clear sign that some motivation is not strong enough. And therefore, we get back to this fundamental issue which, with which people who are doing, they are confronted all the time. Because it's like climbing a hill. It's like climbing a mountain. And the question which you address to you in the morning, when you wake up, and in the evening when you go to bed, is, am I going to climb more of this mountain or not? No? Do I take a break or do I keep climbing the mountain here? And that is obviously a matter of aspiration. And uh, I just thought about it, trying to approach it in another way, to show you another angle. Some of you are used with our lectures about <clears throat> Ishvara Pranidhana and other of the moral values from yoga, but I'm trying to approach in another way, because if I would talk only about the highest part of yoga, this would be incomplete, because many types of motivation or so-called aspiration would be left out. The truth is that there are people who have motivations and aspirations which do not come only from the highest thing in yoga. That's why tonight and in this satsang, 
I would like to take another approach, more integrative, more holistic, to show you that this aspiration, motivation, these grounds of our yoga practice are of many kinds and on many levels. And of course, they will have different outcomes, but still, they are part of one whole dimension, one greater dimension. We who are interested in the spiritual part of yoga, and definitely people have done yoga for 10 years, must be interested in something very deep in yoga, or there are people who are having such severe health problems and physical problems that even 10 years of yoga were not enough to eradicate those problems and they need to be checked in, kept in control, kept under check, kept in check every day of their lives and therefore for some people their karma is so peculiar that even then the motivation can come from somewhere else. But for those of us who are coming, who are interested in the spiritual part of yoga, it's like we sit in the very core of yoga because this is how it was created when Patanjali or other founding fathers, they created yoga. Really, honestly, none of them thought about a fitness industry. None of them thought about Lululemon trousers or something like that. You know, it's not how it appeared. The fact that uh, there are Lululemon trousers and there is a fitness in the, it's actually good. In the big picture, it's a million times better than people who sit in a pub and they get sloshed on alcohol. Uh, if they were wearing Lululemons and doing yoga, their life would be better quality in my personal opinion. And that's why, um, but we sit in the very core of yoga, like on a mountain top, if you want, and we can have the bird's view, the eagle eye, the eagle view of all the motivations. Why do people climb different parts of this mountain of yoga? And that's why somehow I would, I, my integrative approach, my holistic approach, is to admit that all the motivations are causally interrelated. Uh, somebody was asking me to comment on the Buddhist concept of dependent causation, that all the causes of all the events, karma in its totality, it's like a universal chain that connects everything with everything at the level of the music of the spheres, in Ajna Chakra and at the high planes of the universe, everything is interconnected. And that's why the karma of everybody is interconnected with the karma of everybody. And this is called dependent causation. And that's why even the smaller motivations, even the secondary grounds, yeah, I will use this metaphoric word uh, for it, although even I myself, because I'm not born in the English language, when I read about uh, a Buddhist book about grounds and so on, I was thinking, what the heck are they talking about? After I read 10 pages of the book, then I understood what they meant by the grounds because they were explaining it and I understood, oh, they are speaking about the aspiration, the motivation, the reason why you do these things and they call it the ground for it. Which, of course, if you are very good in, if you are a native English speaker, you will understand that it's a metaphoric way of explaining that. So um, it's a bit of a colorful explanation there. And uh, that's why speaking about the grounds and paths, you know, why do you follow a certain path? Why do some people want to do the sexual tantric yoga and some people don't want to practice the sexual tantric yoga? Why do some people want to do meditation and some people are more interested in selfless service and action like social action or others? And activism, if you prefer to use a modern word. And thus, all these and many others, they are causally interrelated. A person who may be forced by a disease to do yoga for 10 years, because they had cancer 
and they were on the brink of death, and then they got afraid, and then they did yoga to preserve their lives and to stay away from pain, agonizing death, and other such things, which a major disease like cancer can bring, then such a person may discover that that aspiration, that ground, that motivation, was actually produced by the grace of a cosmic power, that it was produced by karma from a previous life, that it was produced by an action of their subconscious mind, which was actually trying to guide them in another direction, and the meaning of it was not the disease. The disease was an excuse, but actually in their life, there was something much deeper, which four years later, they start discovering, and 10 years later, they are clear about it, and they say, aha, this is why I was, you know, then they come to bless their lives, just like Milarepa in the end of his life. He started his yoga because his father was murdered and his property, the property of their family, of his mother, had been stolen by greedy relatives in his family. And he was inclined, at the request of his mother, to learn black magic and to practice black magic and he knew for sure that he had caused the death of at least 35 people, which is not a joke to have on your conscience in one lifetime the death of 35 people or more. You know? And therefore, really, Milarepa practiced Buddhist teachings just to save himself from hell, just not to go to hell, trying to find a desperate way to compensate for the miserable karma, which because of his ego, because of his willpower, because of his temperament, he had created. And then, in the end of the life, he says, I actually now say thank you to the people who killed my father and persecuted my mother, because without them, I would have never become Milarepa. Without them, I wouldn't have reached to be what I am, they were the ones which pushed my life and pushed my evolution in the direction of a crazy yoga practice which took me where I am. And that's why be aware of the fact that no motivation can necessarily be considered inferior or secondary, no aspiration, because in the end it's part of a bigger story it's part of this dependent causation. It's part of this karmic chain which connects all the parts of this holographic universe. And that's why I am very happy tonight to look a little bit with you through the structure of, you know, why do yoga, why do people do, what are the motivations, what is the aspiration. You know, maybe somebody listening to this lecture will find that they had a motivation and they never thought that yoga could be an answer to that motivation and actually they find out that they didn't even know what yoga is because most people think that yoga is just pushing your head between your legs and making a donut out of yourself or some other bizarre geometrical forms you know, twisting yourself until you break your joints, and uh, the result of it is having great fitness or great-looking shoulders or great-looking legs or God knows what other great-looking thing. And thus, uh, of course, there is a lot of confusion in this. So I would like to start, obviously, with the simple down-to-earth motivations where we know that some people try are motivated by the needs of their body, by the needs of their health. And here we already go into a full level of confusion and misunderstanding because some people try to simplify my statement that, oh, I do yoga because of something in my body or something. They try to simplify it materialistically, like everything is motivated by the body because these people think that the consciousness is in the brain. It comes from your kidneys, it, like from your adrenal glands, it comes from this, it comes from that. 
or it comes from a section of your brain, some neural activity, but the yogis think, see it in a totally different way, as most of you know. Would the yogis see it otherwise, and that's why they cannot limit that, oh, everything is just because there is some sort of skewed need or peculiar need in the body. But because there are definitely needs of the body, unfortunately, because our physical body is, according to the metaphysics of yoga, the most opaque, opaque means that light does not go through. So consciousness, awareness, is very difficult to go through the physical body, especially when in that physical body you are adding tobacco, coffee, con conservants, chemicals, whatever, marijuana, whatever you add in there, and then the physical body sometimes doesn't let you see. The physical creatures, including us ourselves, are the most blind of all the creatures. They don't see the picture of the universe. Yogananda Paramahamsa comes and tells you about the seven planes of the universe, the parallel existence. You are reading it, it's like a fairy tale. It's like a science fiction novel. You know, theoretically, your spirit should react instantly and say, yes, that's the truth. I can see it in my mind right away. This man is speaking the truth. This is the reflection of the reality in words and concepts. But we don't, and because most people don't, yes, Ramakrishna did, Shivananda did, Mahananda Mai did, many did, but uh, they were either born very special or it took special events or they were ready, they were ripe for this understanding. And because I said the physical body is so opaque, here potential students, people who theoretically should come to yoga running, they are often confused by maya and confused by their own pain, as Buddha has called this samsara as a world of pain, and therefore they cannot see it clearly. Theoretically, no, let's catch the bull by the horns and say something which can, you know, which is definitely politically incorrect, and especially since this stupid pandemic thing, it has been acute, made more acute online, like people have been persecuted on socialization networks and other places just for expressing opinions about alternative health or other things which simply go in another direction than the official medical system. No. Theoretically, if people would see clearly, any, anybody on this planet who has, let's say, a cancer, let's go to a real big one, they should come and do yoga like crazy. This island should be full with 100,000 cancer patients who are all gravitating in circles around Agama's yoga hall, all of them applying desperately to do two, three, four, five, six, eight hours of yoga per day because compared to what the allopathic medicine is offering today, yoga is definitely better. I am saying again, I don't expect the World Health Organization to agree with me on that. I don't expect the pharmaceutical industry to uh, agree with me on that. I don't even uh, expect the American Cancer Association to agree with me on that, but that is God's truth. And thus, I'm telling you straight this because why don't people see it when you read, especially today in an age of information? It's true, many people have a very poor education and very many people, they are functional, Ill, functionally illiterate. They read but they cannot go more than the title of an article or a few, you know, 15 seconds of attention span. No. And unfortunately for such people, they will probably never read the research done by the Lonavla Yoga Institute in India, the books of Swami Kuvalayananda, 
the books of Swami Shivananda Sarasvati or others to see with their own eyes and from people that had a professional authority that what I say is not the creation of this Swami Vivekananda Sarasvati, but it is actually uh, substantiated in the alternative medical literature for a century or more than that. That's why, you know, that's why I say people don't see it clearly because we, I tell to people in the What is Yoga lecture when we do it here in the first day of the courses, yes, yoga cannot solve some things. The other day I had some pain in one of my back teeth here and I'm worried if I'm having some defect in that tooth and I will have to go to the dentist for it because as much as I stand on my head or as much as I do mantra meditations, it will not heal my tooth. And therefore, people in yoga know very clearly that to hope that yoga can solve for, for you certain problems is absurd, it's utopian, and it is a clear recipe for trouble. It will bring you trouble because you are going to hope to solve the problem with a method which will not work for that problem. But also, the people who have done things in yoga, they know that if one has the willpower, the self-discipline, the perseverance, and the motivation to actually do yoga consistently, then yoga will work for approximately 75% of the human health better or very well in collusion, very well in integration with the official medical systems. I am not including here Ayurvedic Indian medicine, Tibetan medicine, Chinese traditional medicine, other forms of herbal naturistic medicine such as homeopathy, chiropractic and other things which all of them together they create a wonderful array of methods which intelligently used, they really can give superior benefits, much more holistic ways of addressing the problems of the body, of the health, of other physically related things. And thus, we say, surely, there are people who have a motivation there. No? I have known people who are semi-paralyzed from polio, as I describe that case always in one of my lectures for the beginners. No. And that girl was doing yoga because she hated being paralyzed. She was thinking about the alternative of committing suicide. So it was commit suicide or do yoga every day, lots and lots. No. Of course, yoga was better than a suicide, was less scary than a suicide, <coughs> and therefore, <coughs> she made the right choice. But there are many other people who had polio and who got handicapped in one way or another from polio, and they are not at the door of our yoga hall trying to do authentic yoga, real yoga, working on chakras, energies, mind, brain, working on the real profound things and functions of the body. Therefore, this is the story in many places. There are people who have physical problems. Okay, I will admit physically also means some brain problems, some neurological problems, like people suffering from a, I don't know what to say, a Down syndrome. The Down syndrome is not an emotional problem. It's a pure brain neurological problem. It's a defect in the construction of the brain. People that suffer from Alzheimer's, they also have a problem which is identifiable physically in the brain. Now, you cannot say that there are people who got stressed out and now they are taking refuge in a corner of their brain and they have Alzheimer and because of this they separate from the world. It's not. It's actually a self-intoxication of the brain which produces certain plaquettes and other substances which slowly, slowly choke the brain 
and kill the brain cells and produce a massive depletion of the brain tissue, but it is explained in, even in the official medicine as a chemical pollution. And the list could continue. No? And yes, there are sometimes things which manifest as a mental problem. Even certain forms of schizophrenia have been ascribed by alternative doctors and yogis, first of all, first and foremost, to the consumption of sugar. Like there have been schools in America and other institutions like the Mayo Clinic and others which have cut the sugar consumption under any form whatsoever and they had people with symptoms of schizophrenia completely normal in a period of three months only of having just a diet without sugar and without other chemicals like without aspartame, without uh, monosodium glutamate and a few other of these classical poisons which exist in 80% of the products sold in supermarkets. And thus, I'm simply saying, uh, theoretically, we who are in yoga, we expect that people can see at least that, okay, people don't want to become like Milarepa. Milarepa is even a bad example because he was a murderer and a black magician. But let's say people don't want to be like Ramakrishna because Ramakrishna didn't get to yoga because he committed any felony or any crime. And he just got to yoga because he got to yoga, because that's what he was interested into since he was a child. And when he became a teenager, he knew that that was the call in his heart. And that's why I'm saying maybe there are people who don't understand the motivations and the aspiration of one like Ramakrishna. But you would expect that people that have at least certain types of health and physical problems, they should flock to yoga. They should abundantly you know, see that there is there, that there are there solutions which are brilliant, which are amazing, which are really good. And they could study, they could read literature, they could consult with open-minded, holistic therapists, yoga therapists, and others, and they would see the light. But you see, because of the pain and because of the karma which they have, the maya is hypnotizing them, the maya is confusing them, and then they look for other solutions. They are afraid, they are confused, they run like chickens whose head has been cut off. They run in circles like this. They are going nowhere. They are trying many wrong solutions. And in the end, they say, how could I have known? Well, how did other people know? Because there are other people who used yoga, homeopathy, acupuncture, oil pulling, whatever we are talking about. No, minor therapies or major methods, and they have obtained results. Why some people saw it, and some people are ha hit with a hammer over their heads, and they cannot see it. Therefore, the people who get this, they get a lot of aspiration. Sometimes there can be some karmic compensations, like, I have seen sometimes such people suffering, compensating one thing for another. We have seen people compensating emotional suffering or physiological suffering with financial loss. They were here to heal a disease and then somebody stole their purse from their motorbike while they were driving the motorbike. During the driving, some of this circus local mafia, they came and snatched their passport and money purse from the basket on their motorbike. No? And then when they meditated deeper, they said, I lost a thousand dollars, but I'm healed of my cancer. No? Is there a compensation somewhere there? No? So again, uh, it's not as simple as that, but people who do this, 
people who engage themselves in this, they know that there can occur karmic compensations, but it is the safest way to do these things through your own personal effort by manifesting your free will. That's why we know, I know many people who came to yoga because of a physical problem, and then they were so grateful, and then they discover so much deeper things that they stayed in yoga, and their motivation four years later was a different motivation, perhaps much deeper, but at least different, we can say. And thus, here, there is, you know, sometimes we are tempted to minimize this, but on the other hand, people's health, pain, suffering, body, and the issues which come from there, they are so present in their lives, and they can be so handicapping that sometimes this motivation is holistic. Just to jump to a totally different example, when Edgar Cayce discovered that the American sleeping prophet, so-called, when he discovered that he was endowed with the capacity to go in a trance and find healing solutions for people all over the world in a state of pure knowledge, accessing in a state of trance the minds of all the healers and doctors from this planet and extracting from there the useful information, then he didn't want to use it. He didn't want to become what he was already. He didn't want, he was a photographer and he wanted to stay a bloody photographer. You know, but he could heal amazing diseases. He could advise people. And then what happened is that for three weeks or whatever, he became blind. He became blind. Either it was some guardian angel who punished him to spank him a little bit, to give him a measure of what he was supposed to do, or it was his own subconscious mind which was reacting like his own higher self knew what his dharma was, and then his own subconscious mind blocked his vision, and he said, man, you are about to fail your life. You are about to do the wrong thing. You know, wake up. It doesn't matter where it came from. These are uh, epistemological things. You know, we are talking about the theory of knowledge, like where did that thing came f come from, but the point is that sometimes a physical suffering and a motivation of that type can have much deeper roots and it should not be underestimated because it can go somewhere else. Then we have other categories of people who when doing yoga, they are motivated by the needs of daily life and of the associated emotional and mental challenges. Daily life, many people say life is hard. If you ask people, at least 75% of people would put their head down like an ox which has a heavy yoke on his neck, on his back, and like an ox which can look only down in the ground, they will say life is hard. Especially when people have lived for a while, they have had some occurrences of negative karma and they have been hit by life and they have experienced pain. And then even those which have an optimistic and positive temperament sometimes say, yeah, but sometimes life can be a bitch, life can be really hard and all that. And that's why people are constantly looking for ways to deal with life. Buddha, when he decided to run into the forest, he decided to lose his life. He simply decided life is pain, it is useless. At the end of life you have old age, illness, the death and the likes. Why am I happy to be here? Because right now I'm 30 years old he left his palace allegedly when he was 35 or 36 years old, you know, and now I'm healthy and happy and I didn't have a painful disease yet. Maybe he had disease when he had to change his teeth as a child. Like almost everybody, he fell and bruised his knee or something. You no know, minor pains, but he never had a cancer or he, they never amputated one of his limbs or something. But he realized, just by looking, he realized 
I'm going head forward into the dark side of my life, into the painful side of my life. What is there to be happy about? That I'm a prince and that I have a nice wife and that I'm having a child coming up and maybe I'll have another one and another one? Why will that make me happy? So again, there are people who are not like Buddha. Buddha was an example of the high level seeker who at some point painfully realized that there is not too much glory in the daily life. That people constantly try to praise the daily life, like I have this job, I have this money, I have these children, I have this whatever, I wrote a book, or I read 10,000 books, or whatever, you know. And in the end, when you look in the final mirror before kicking the bucket, it's like everything is going down into pretty much nothing. The religious people, at least they have some hopes. They say, Virgin Mary and Jesus the Christ will come and pull me by the tuft of my hair when I'm dead, and they will take me to the kingdom of heaven, and I will be saved or whatever. But they don't know for sure. They haven't seen it. They haven't experienced it before, except the great saints. And as such, it's just a hope. And maybe, cross fingers, that hope could be true, although there is no certainty of any kind. And that's why I'm saying that the people who are motivated by the needs of life, because the needs of life, you know, how many people have been honestly panicked by the coronavirus? It's not a question for you. It's a rhetorical question for the whole planet. I could not believe it, both in this country where I live these days and in my native country and in other countries, I have seen people honestly, honestly, honestly panicked by it. People who believed in the World Health Organization narrative about this epidemic, pandemic, whatever it was, whatever sources it had, we are not into conspiracy theories tonight, we are in searching our souls, and those people were panicked. And they were like, you know, oh my God, you know, I'm afraid, what if I die? I heard millions of people died and all sorts. The narration is out there still, you know, st still stating some things. And if you go and say the opposite on Facebook or God knows what, they cancel your account. They will simply cancel you because you are not towing the line. You are not uh, listening to the party line. You know, which has decided that that's the politically correct truth which has to be said. You know? And thus, there were people who would ask, if I do yoga, will my immunity become stronger? If I do yoga, will I be more protected from diseases? If I get infected with this mysterious virus, which is the 19th in a whole series of coronaviruses, it's one of the many mutations, will I be... Will I have a lighter form if I do yoga? Will there be any benefit in doing yoga for me into this? No. And thus, you see, when you look at daily life, even coming back to the physical body, but you see, this is not directly a problem like I have a pain. I don't have a pain. But they say that there is an epidemic out there. Now it's the smallpox of the monkeys, the monkeypox or something, you know. It's a new boogeyman out there. If the monkeypox is coming, be prepared, you know. And then the question is the same. Will I die of the monkeypox? If I do yoga, will I have a better, better chance to deal with it and all that? And that's why uh, here we're not talking about the disease. Here we're talking, I'm not talking about the healing part of yoga. Here I'm talking about the fact that people have a fear. I live in fear. And I'm saying I'm not going to take a bus or a train, or an airplane, because I could get the monkeypox. No? Then you have a lot of existential limitations, and a lot of fear, and 
you all know, in life we have thoughts. People say, I cannot stop the thoughts in my mind. I know, I have students now in the school who told me I have to repeat this mantra one hour per day. I have to do every time when the stupid thoughts are coming to my mind. I'm having some tormenting, ugly, painful thoughts which normally would make me go depressed. I have to fight with those thoughts maybe up to four hours per day. No, every six hours the stupid thoughts are coming back. And I go then back, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, or whatever, you know, simply because I don't want my mind to run into those stupid thoughts. Because if I let it, you know, like people are often tortured by their thoughts, tortured by their emotions. A hundred years ago, the human society was very puritanic compared to what it is today. And people in the so-called civilized cultures, either it was Asian or European or whatever it was, people were not allowed to express openly their emotions beyond a certain level. Even their positive emotions, like if you wanted to cry for Jesus Christ, you were not supposed to do it on the street on the Fifth Avenue in New York. Go in a fucking church and there, cry with Jesus as much as you want. But you disturb people on the street if you start kneeling in the middle of the Times Square and you want to cry there for Jesus. You know, it's like you, you would be taken to a mental institution for such an action. Perhaps not today, again I'm saying because the society has grown very loose from this standpoint. And thus, people... There was an emotional discipline, and especially when the emotions became negative, people had to hold them into check. It was not moral, it was not ethical, it was against the law. You know, like you want to suddenly kiss or maybe have sex in public because you are horny. That's a no-no. You want to beat somebody or insult somebody, no. You don't do that in public and others. It's true. Sometimes people's barriers broke and people started doing a war against each other. There were vendettas. There has been violence on the face of this earth for the last 3,000 years. But today, when people do psychotherapy and children are taught to be free and express their emotions and their mamas don't spank them anymore, there is more war than there was a hundred years ago. The 20th century has been the most war charged up century and most millions of people died in the whole history of humanity. And the 21st century started very bad. Already in 20 years, we had everything from the Iraq war and the Afghanistan things and so many others until now when a war, several wars are raging on some places of the most known is this Russia-Ukraine war, but it's not the only place where people shoot each other in a public conflict. There are open conflicts in other parts as well. You now people shoot each other in Kashmir over the, the or dilemma if Kashmir belongs to India or Pakistan. You know, and others, you know, I could give you so many examples, there are places of conflict which are so old that the newspapers don't even write about them anymore because everybody got fed up with it and it's bored. Like, ah, oh, yeah, the India-Pakistan conflict. It's been there since the 1950s. No, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist anymore. It does exist. Israel is at, in a state of war with I don't know how many Arabic and Islamic countries still today. The war is not declared quenched, stopped. And that's why I say, it's like, what are you talking about? And thus, uh, for people, there are thoughts, emotions, and really, the more the humanity becomes loose, morally and ethically, the more these thoughts and emotions, instead of saying, oh, but you should be free. Yeah, but if you are free, and your nature is an ugly nature, then you go in an ugly place. It's not, that's not what Jesus said. That's not what Buddha said. That's not what Krishna said. That's not what the prophet Muhammad or Moses 
said, that's not what, I don't know, Buddha, I quoted him already, said, you know, they all of them recommend a certain strict moral and ethical self-discipline. You, know, you have a negative emotion that you hate people around you and you mistrust them and, you know, what do you do? You just let it be there and say, maybe I'm true, maybe the world is a jungle, maybe everybody hates me, maybe this, maybe that. You know, and then the darkness is just increasing and increasing. So, thoughts, emotions. Now, here I'm not talking about health, I'm talking about emotional health, but I'm talking in the meaning of your life, the integration in the events of life. Is your life happy? Is your life going fulfilled? Is your life good quality? Let's mention the people who have no meaning of life. You know, there are so many people in the neo-Marxistic culture of today, in North America, in Europe, either they have the woke mentality or others, either they are emos or millennials or whatever they are, you know, there is no meaning. They live there. You know, when I first moved to the West, immediately after the fall of the Iron Curtain, I was so curious to see people sitting in a square in Copenhagen, you know, a very happy country by the statistics, you know, and uh, sitting there with a bottle of Tuborg or Carlsberg beer, you know, and staying there for three hours and looking at people passing on the main street and two friends talking by a bottle of beer. I was confused. It's like I didn't understand something about the essence of the life of those people. Like what were they doing with their life? Because when I had half an hour, I was running to the Royal Library of Copenhagen to read one more book, to learn something. When I had time in my daytime, I would do yoga. I would teach yoga. I would do karma yoga in advertising for yoga or cleaning the floor for the people who would come to do yoga or something. No, I didn't feel that I wanted to waste my life on two bottles of beer. No, it was like it was a terrible waste of time. No? Today, like today, this very day, I slept a little bit much. No? There is a corner of my mind which feels guilty because I slept too much and I could have done something in the time which I spent sleeping. No? Because so much sleep is not needed. Napoleon said a man should sleep seven hours, a woman should sleep eight hours because of probably being a bit more muladharistic, more heavy, more connected to the earth, and an idiot sleeps nine hours. No? Today I have been an idiot according to the definition of Napoleon because I'm wasting my life in sleeping when I know that I will lie down in a coffin and then I will be sleeping a lot. So there is not time to sleep now. No, now it's time to do something with this physical body and with the life. No? But I have been so shocked to see so many people in the Western culture who have absolutely no meaning of life. Like they don't find that they want to do anything. They would skydive, they would uh, paraglide, they would go to Médecins Sans Frontières, they would uh, do extreme sports. They would buy themselves expensive cars if they have the money for it. They would dress themselves a la Michael Jackson, flamboyantly. They would do this, they would do that. But in the end, they, they would get bored of everything. They would do things for a while, then they would get bored. They would go to prostitutes. No. Then prostitution is not enough after five years. Then they will go to BDSM to sadomasochism and bondage because, you know, prostitution has become boring and dull and you have to have somebody whip your ass or something to feel some more excitement. No? Like people's lives, although they are afraid to admit it, they are often empty. You ask people, they don't even want to think about it. You ask, what will you do? Uh, if I'm disciplined enough, I will become an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. If I'm not disciplined enough to study the university, 
if I'm not smart enough to graduate from a university and I don't have discipline in my mind, then I guess I will become an installator, a plumber, an electrician, a garage manager. I will be washing cars in a car wash. I will do a less intellectual work, you know. So basically everybody thinks like, I need to get a job. I need to get a career. And when I had that career, and I know that I can probably put money and food on my table, then uh, maybe I should make a family. Okay, if I'm in Saudi Arabia, a family means four wives, and if I am in Denmark, a family means one wife. But okay, I'm going to family, get a family, maybe a Mormon family with 10 wives, or a Tibetan family with five husbands. It's possible the other way around as well. You know, so it doesn't matter what kind of family, but just a sort of a intimate environment where I can feel safe, where I can take my underwear off and go bare ass, and because I'm in my family, I am in my own house. You know, and there I have house warmth, people tolerate me, you know, whatever. I am in my own circle of trust there. You know, emotional comfort, but of course people who had a family for 10 years they know that there is no fucking emotional comfort and the family is drilling you day and night and eventually people commit suicide or they run on another continent just to stay away from their family. You know, so lovely the family is. And I will have a family and I'll have kids and of course not too many kids because my wife doesn't want her yoni torn apart. So if she makes one kid, it's like an act of heroism. You know, while our grandmothers were having 15 in a row for a rugby team, you know, and so now you make one and you feel like you made a hole in the skies, you know, you've conquered the universe, you've gone to another galaxy already, you know. That kid will very often happen to be a, in success. I've had friends who were of an IQ which was insanely high. I've been among such people, and they, be they went to America, and they became multi-multi-millionaires, Silicon Valley, multi-multi-millionaires, and all kind of thing. And then they forgot to make a kid, and they adopted a kid. And when that kid was five years old, she started stealing from other people's lockers, from the kindergarten. And they said, you cannot steal, and therapy, go to a therapist, and so on. And the kid gave them the finger. She said, you can't make me stop. Stop, try to stop me to see if you can stop me. No? No? Then if the kid goes on like, they were at the end of their wits. These were millionaire people who could pay high level psychologists and so on. No? The kid had a demon up their ass and wanted to manifest it, wanted to show it. No? And thus, what I'm trying to say even the kid is a lottery, you know. My mom says, I have made one kid, that would be me, you know. And you haven't been living in the country where I live for the last 32 years. And I'm alone, your dad has died. I'm living like an owl alone, alone in an empty house. Nobody visits me because I'm 84 years old and I have nothing interesting to say anymore. And basically now I'm looking at the walls and I started praying to Jesus. And I'm saying, very good, mom. I'm happy that somebody spanked you and got you to pray to Jesus, you know. But people don't pray to Jesus before, you know. At the time when they still have foolish hopes that some miracle will happen with their family, with their career, with their house, with their pieces of land, with their kids, you know. If somebody would have told me when I was 20 years old, you're going to be a great level engineer, have a swimming pool with your house, have a career, make uh, inventions in the domain of electricity and electronics, you're going to have two successful kids and a wife and you will divorce her, but then you are going to find the second wife who will be really, really loving you. And like, I'm not a utopian thing. I'm not trying to make it like, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. I'm trying to make it like realistic, you know, and so on. And still I would have looked and said, and then, 
I'm going to be 70 years old and I'm going to look at my coffin and I'm going to say that's the place where I go? It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. And many people refuse to acknowledge that it's a tragedy. Like what's your life? To just have studies and get a job and work like a slave? How many of you will become like Elon Musk to have $200 billion on your account? No, those are people you count on the fingers of the hands. No, those are, okay, a few hundreds people on the face of the earth. They are less than the people who won the national lottery. There's more people who won national lotteries than people who became as rich as Warren Buffett or Bill Gates on the like, or Jeff Bezos or the likes of them. And that's why, now in the end, most people have a self-contained business or they work for Shell Oil or God knows for what capitalists. They get squeezed like lemons. They work hard to hold the balance. They have a suburban house, a car, two cars, five cars if they are collectors of cars and so on. They have some kids which can be a success or in success. And then they say, yeah, it will be a good life. I'm sorry, I cannot be on the same page. And all my yoga teachers were not on this page. They were not seeing it. They saw this as a terrible, boring prison, as a prison planet, as a place where, like a hamster, you are turning into a circle all the time. You are running like a squirrel in a cage. You are not, you are, what do you get? What do you get which you didn't get in the previous life? What do you get which, like nothing. At least if you go to war, and kill 250 people because you are the best warrior in the army of Genghis Khan, at least you have an entertaining life. At least it's not like the previous one, you know? At least kill 250 people and do something unheard of, you know? There are people who are famous for something, you know? The biggest ally pilot in the Second World War took down 60 German aircraft. He managed to take down 60 German aircraft in dogfights, fighting plane against plane. He took 60. You know how much was the best German pilot in the Second World War? He took out 650. No. Hey, you know, he has 650 lives on his conscience, or maybe, you know? But he is in the world record. He's in the Guinness Book of Records. You know, there is a man who took down in direct dogfights 600 fucking airplanes of people who are trained to fly an airplane and to fight against him. No? That's why I say, you know, it's like, I, I think a dull life is the most punishing thing that there can be. At least if you are like Magellan and you take a boat and sail around the globe for the first time, there is some excitement. My Magellan died before he finished it. But hey, there is at least some excitement in your life. No? I am definitely not the one who loves a dull life in this way. And it's like just the perspective that I could have a bourgeois life. It's like, you know, an early suicide can be much more fun than that. You know, at least live until you have the first symptoms of cancer, drink, fuck, do whatever. And when you finally reach the edge, put a rope onto your neck and go singing. You know, it's like, what the fuck? You know, I just lived to become a boring bourgeois with a car and two kids and a dog. And, uh, you know, and that's all I have done in my life. It's scary. I'm looking at my coffin. I'm 70 years old and I'm looking at my coffin and I say, yeah, but I have been a great engineer. But fuck all the engineers in the world and all the engineering in the world, you know. I look at my coffin, for God's sake, and I have done nothing. I have just lived like a biological entity. Oh, yeah, don't forget, there was a time when you had $500,000 in your bank account. You know, stop boring me to death, you know. It's like, okay, at least if I had 200 billions, I would have said, you know, at least it's not so boring, you know? At least something is colorful. But otherwise, 
So that's why I say this thing with the life is much more profound than you believe because many people have not searched their hearts. Many people have not made a projection in the future, like I'm 70 years old and I have done this and this and this and this. Every Sunday I went to picnic with my family. <laughs> Fuck them all, shoot them with a machine gun, like these guys in America, you know, shoot. This was my life that I felt good that every Sunday we were going near a forest edge and we were putting some barbecue and we ate bar. Is this my life? You know, I'm reading Galileo Galilei and I'm reading Leonardo da Vinci and I'm reading Albert Einstein and that's what you want me to do? To have two kids and to see my lab retriever running in circles? You know, this is my fucking life. You know, it's, at least I don't know how it works for you. Maybe for you, it sounds like comfortable, cozy. For me, and I have been attracted to wild teachers who were thinking like me, for me, this was like, you know, suicide is a better option. I don't want this. I don't want, it's like I'm in a cage. I'm like a caged tiger. You tell me you are in a cage in a zoo and you are going to be in that fucking cage until you die. Then why not shoot me? Shoot me today and put an end to this. No, it's not good enough. It's my soul cannot take it. My soul is dreaming about something more, greater. You know, if you tell me that I will reach the love of Christ, that I would reach the love of God and I would melt in ecstasy, being carried in a bliss and kind of seeing beyond this life and seeing eternity. And yes, that would be an experience. You know, I wonder if you are talking maybe about uh, taking ecstasy or some, I mean, I'm wondering if it can actually exist. I'm walking, I'm wondering if you are trying to cheat me with some cheap chemical ecstasy or if it's the real deal. But at least you are opening a door where I'm saying infinite love. If you would have come to me as a young physicist to be and as a young engineer to be when I was 16 years old, when I was 19 years old, when I was perhaps even 20 years old, and you have told me, you know, you can discover the great love of God, I would have never done yoga because I did not have almost any feeling about love. I did not understand it in the way in which I can understand it today. It was not part it was, it was a chakra which was not. I was interested in sex, but I was not understanding anything about love. No, if I started ever to read a love poem, I probably didn't read more than half of it. No, by the half of it, I was bored already, not understanding what the fuck that poet was wasting his time with. No, it sounded like waste of time. No, because I could not understand it and because I had not felt it. But when I felt the superior parts of Anahata Chakra, even for a short glimpse, then I knew that this was something desirable and higher than any career, higher than any family, higher than any money, higher than any fame in the world, higher than anything. And so, there are people for whom yoga is a way which opens, it gives them meaning in life. Like suddenly people who have done our level one, our first level of yoga, they come to me with sparkling eyes and they say, we didn't know this thing existed. I thought my life was finished. I never dared to hope that something can do what yoga does and now I know that I want to do something, that I want to see something, I want to change something. And people are plagued by loneliness. Some people are lonely 
and they love their space, and they love to be with themselves, but maybe not too much. And they don't realize that yoga can give you the environment of like-minded people, because maybe you are lonely, because everybody around you speaks about football all day long, and they are fucking idiots. They just talk about beer and football, you know? And if you don't want to talk about beer and football, then you've got no friends. Then you feel like you want to stay away from everything and everybody. On the contrary, some people are plagued by over-socializing, because some people have pathologically open svadhisthana chakras, and they all the time have to be on TikTok, on Facebook, on whatever, because they have to socialize, 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 and socializing is like a drug. No, they are pathologically addicted to it. And for such people, suddenly, yoga gives them the exact measure, the exact balance point where you can meet, but you can meet with people when it's meaningful, when it speaks to your heart, when it speaks to your soul, when it speaks to your refined part of the mind, and you can also stay away from people, especially when you need your space, when you need to be with your thoughts, when you need to be with your aspirations. And there are people who in life, they experience power conflicts, personality conflicts. The ego is a tricky thing. And for most people, especially in Kali Yuga, nowadays, their ego is very skewed. We see more and more people with skewed personalities. When the education, I have to say it, you probably will think that I'm a dinosaur coming from the other century, and therefore I'm old-fashioned. You can think that. It's fine. Free, feel free to think that. I'm not ashamed of it in any way. Uh, but when the education was more structured, people were having a little bit more of this uh, harmonious personality. Yes, even growing in the medieval Christianity or under some strange Hindu or Buddhist environment, it would create skewed personalities, but not as much as what's happening today. In the 1960s, people thought that education should go freely, just like the wind, like this. And the result is that the conflicts of personality, the autistic, schizophrenic, paranoid, panic attacks, all sorts of personality disorders, borderliners and others, they are way bigger. They are way more and more. The numbers are multiplying, not decreasing. It was believed that people, there were schizophrenics 150 years ago, and it was believed that they were schizophrenic because their mama spanked them. Then their mama didn't spank them, and suddenly there were twice as many schizophrenics in the society, per capita, per inhabitant. No, the percentage grew bigger. It didn't go slower. Study the history of psychic medicine, of psychological medicine, and you will see we are not in a happy time from this standpoint. No? So therefore, when we talk about controlling your life, it's one thing that you can do flick flacks and go to Cirque du Soleil. It's one thing that you can be fit. It's one thing that you can look good and be sexy because you do yoga. It's one thing that you do yoga and you are not afraid of COVID or of monkeypox. It's one thing that you do yoga because you can control a little bit better your thoughts and emotions. It's another thing that you start having a meaning that you see that there actually might be a purpose in life and you should not waste your life drinking Carlsberg beer. They'll probably sue me. So I'll mention also Tuborg and all the others, Faxe, all the Danish beers, whichever of them, shouldn't drink them sitting in the sunshine like a bum for three hours in a plaza from Copenhagen, you know, wasting your life on looking at the people passing on the street. Unless you are doing some uh, Buddhist meditation on transiency. You no, know, you look at them on the street and you see them how they pass and die. 
you know, and you say another one going to the bucket, another one dying, another deadly, another mortal person. Maybe it's a meditative. Then congratulations, you are doing the right thing, you know. But otherwise, you know, you are just sitting there and talking nonsense and feeling the mild warmth of the Scandinavian sunshine. <laughs> no? Loneliness, chaotic socializing and over socializing power conflict, how many people have we known in yoga who came to yoga simply because they were skewed in their search for power and they had a sickness about the quest for power. And of course, I could say so many more things, all of them as an image of life, that life brings us challenges and people come to yoga because they simply say, if I don't do yoga, I lose my hope, I lose my meaning, I lose my health. I am starting becoming schizophrenic again, or paranoid, or some, every time I don't do yoga for six months, I start having panic attacks again, you know. Then people are motivated, and these motivations can come from the Supreme Self. These motivations can come from much deeper than you expect. And, but already here, we have crossed in a profound yoga. Because if yoga is done as a gymnastics and as a contortionism, then it does not prevent personality disorders or it doesn't give you hope for the meaning of life or others. So we already have crossed the line with 90% of the yoga and more, which is taught on this planet, that it is taught as a physical fitness thing. Then you have to go to the real yoga, to the authentic yoga, even to be able to control some of the circumstances of your life. And then we go even deeper. There are people who are motivated by the search of the mysterious. Mysterious. Sometimes I speak about mysteries, and when I speak, I tumble down an endless rabbit hole because life on this planet is so mysterious. And from the question if aliens visited this planet 40,000 years ago to the question if the moon is an artificial satellite of the Earth and there is an invisible base on the other side of it, from the side, if there were indeed people on this planet who lived a thousand years, like Matushalech or whatever his Hebrew name was, and finishing with uh, the question if the earth is hollow and there is a civilization on the inner side of the earth, and the list could continue. Are there paranormal powers? Can people fly through the air? Was there somebody who was witnessed truly, truly flying through the air? And we, we are not talking about David Copperfield, the stage magician, and all that. No, there are so many mysteries that for some people it's tiresome. They hear one, they hear two, and then because they are too tamasic, they want to close the book and not to hear anymore because it's too exciting. You're not going to be able to sleep in the night. It stirs you up. But there are people who surrender to this momentum and they say, okay, let me not sleep in the night. Let's go the whole way in this rabbit hole and see how deep it goes. No? People, there are people for whom the mystery, the magic, the paranormal, whatever, either we talk about forbidden archaeology or we talk about the quest for the invisible worlds, astral projection or whatever is there. Either we talk about telepathy and hypnosis or levitation, or we talk about supreme levels of clairvoyance or whatever, there are people who are motivated. I met people who came to yoga and they said, for my rheumatism, I can do yoga. For opening my third eye, I would not do yoga because I don't even believe, I don't even know if I believe in the third eye and what comes out of it, and I don't feel any emotion about that, and that's why I'm not impatient, I'm not restless, 
I'm not curious, so I will not be motivated to give hours and hours every day exploring that. That's why for some people the grounds of their practice can be different. It's not about body or health. It's not about the fact that I have an empty life and that I'm too lonely and I'm looking for other people who are on the same page with me or for the fact that I get schizophrenic or paranoid when I'm alone or something like that. And thus, here we talk about the deeper meanings and eventually, yes, you all know that there are among us people who after they tried one and the other, eventually they discovered that there was something which was beyond the beyond, that there was something bigger than clairvoyance, bigger than astral projections, bigger than seeing things from the future or from the Akashic recordings of the past, things which were of the spiritual nature. There were people who were simply motivated by the spiritual quest, by the quest of identity. Who am I? No. What am I doing on the face of this earth? Twen ten years ago, or 20 or 30 or 40, I thought life is shit and I wanted to commit suicide. No. Why? Why did I have to go through this valley of tears? Why did I have to go through depression? Why did I have to go through hopelessness? Why did I have to go through not knowing what I am, who I am, and what I do here? We are in a quest of the higher meaning. Not the meaning that uh, I don't want to be an engineer and to have two kids and to look at my coffin, as I said earlier. That's a quest for the lower meaning. Like if you give me a bourgeois, boring life, I'm simply saying I will not be happy with that. It's not enough. I'm greedy. I'm skewed. I'm stupid. But if you give me a normal bourgeois, average life, I will refuse it. I will simply say, no, not interested, sorry. No, other people will say, man, I am in such a misery. I live in hell. I live in a slum of Calcutta or something like this. Give me a good life in America or in Switzerland or somewhere with a family, with a dog. Yeah, a lab retriever, a Labrador would be lovely and so on. And I'm going to kiss your hands. I'm going to be happy. Some people would be happy with just a normal life. But some of us would not. Some of us would not. And maybe we are handicapped here and we are missing a screw. But we would not be happy with it. And that's why here I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the quest of a higher meaning. Like, is there a higher meaning? There are a number of people in this hall uh, and a number of people watching me online, some will watch me tomorrow or in the coming months or something. The question is for all of them there. Is, could there be a possible that I, me, 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 special me, the individual, has been created for a major purpose? Not for a minor purpose. That I lived and I lived and one day I saw a sick dog and put turmeric on its ass, and then it got healthy again. No, it got a healthy fur coat. Oh, so I was born to save uh, little turmeric from his fur. Is that the meaning of life? No, that people are trying to find psychological and emotional compensation in things which are really ridiculous, in things which are really tiny. No. But what about the great meaning? Can there be a great meaning? Did God put his glory into me? That's what Marianne Williamson in that famous quote, which Nelson Mandela read on his inaugural speech when he became the first president of... That's what, he, what she said. He didn't say it. He quoted Marianne Williamson, a female spiritual teacher from America, who said, we are not afraid of our weakness and stupidity. We are afraid of our greatness because we have the consciousness of God with us. 
We can be perfect. We can be brilliant. We can change the world. And we should not stand back from that if, if it arises to us. No? So what's the great motivation if you are a shining child of God? Because in the end you say, oh, I wrote an interesting book. <laughs> Wrong answer, you know, it's like that's all you could do with your life? At least go in a Tibetan cave and stay 12 years walled into a dark room and reach constant astral and mental projection. You know, like do something which not everybody does. No, this is too little still. No, too little. I did not write any book. And therefore, I don't even have the right to compete with that. No? But I'm saying it as a matter of principle. As a matter of principle. Like, is there an immortal, shining goal in you, with you? No? Some people don't even dare to hope. They say, no, no, you are giving me false hopes and then I'm going to be depressed. No, no you are not. Not if you do yoga. You are going to discover that it was true all the way. You are going to discover it was right there all the time. And some people are in quest of liberation. Some people feel trapped. For example, Buddha felt trapped. He said that we live on a prison planet. He called it a prison place. Because everybody is a prisoner of their karma and people pretend that they are free. But they are not. Only he, Buddha, became free after six years of total spiritual practice and after 10,000 lifetimes of spiritual quest. Before of that, people are in quest of enlightenment. Like, I want to know. I want to know. There are people who say, you know what? I don't feel a prisoner because different gurus and different methods and different lineages insist on different aspects of our personality. A disciple comes, there is an Indian story where a disciple comes to his guru and he says, Master, I meditated and, you know, I really want to reach liberation. And the master looks at him like he's an idiot, you know, and he says, who the fuck keeps you prisoner? You know, like, you come to me and you say you want to be free. Like, why aren't you? You know, like, why do you come and tell me that, you're, like, maybe I see you free already. You know, like, what does it mean that you want to be free? Isn't the bondage just a product of your own mind? Isn't it a concept of your own mind that you think I'm bound? But definitely your Atman, who is Brahman, and who is the Shiva consciousness, is not bound by anything. You've never been bound by anything. No? But on the other hand, you have to have, I have karma, and yesterday I fell, and I hurt my knee. And now I'm hurting, and I have a wound there, you know. So you are not free, but then why did you fall yesterday and break your knee? No? It's you are free, or you are not free, or you are, it's, if you look from here, you are free, and if you look from here, you are not. Buddha did not see you or himself as free. But this guru in this story, he has another vision because he looks at another side of the diamond and he wants to approach the issue with another method. But the issue is the same. One is searching for knowledge. Like I want to know. It's really stupid to live in a universe and not to know who you are. What is this universe? Who created it? Who are you? What is your dharma? and all those things. You live in a universe, and you live from today till tomorrow. No? I, for one, have always in my life been frustrated by this. I would love to have more knowledge, and more knowledge, and more knowledge. No? And I never consider that the knowledge is enough. If Shiva can be omniscient, so I want to be also. Because knowledge, no, maybe I'm not obsessed by bondage, but I see another. There is another thing which is scratching my eyes. That's why some people are in a quest for meaning. Some people are in a quest for themselves. Some people are in a quest for freedom. Some people are in a quest for enlightenment. Some people are in a quest for love. 
They say it doesn't matter if you are enlightened or not enlightened, if you know or you don't know, if you are free or you are not free, as long as you are 100% into the love of God, into the presence of God, into the oneness of God, into the heart of God, into God's bosom, into God's kingdom. No. Then you are there, who cares? No. You are already with the one. And then some people say, no, love is great. But you cannot say that love is greater than knowledge, or knowledge is greater than freedom, or freedom is greater than who am I, or these are just different angles. And all those of you who might come to yoga because of some spiritual need, no, you don't suffer from cancer, or you don't suffer from lack of meaning in your daily life or something, nevertheless, no, you are searching for great love, great knowledge or enlightenment, great salvation. I just have a fear and I would like to reach a sort of supernal security, to be in the bosom of God, as one of the Jewish prophets describes, that he felt that he was like God took him and put him in his shirt here, and he was in the bosom of God, right there. No. Then, you know, that is a quest to, 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 to be looking for salvation, to be looking for grace. There is something infinite, which is called grace. Whatever intelligence and power and things we conceive, they are completely nothing. They are dust compared to what grace is. Grace is the Adi Shakti. Grace is the energy of Shiva. Grace is the mother of the universe, is Vatantriya. And when this grace, when we find her, the great goddess, the universal Shakti, then, you know, what is missing? Can people say, I have no freedom, or I have no knowledge, or I have no security or salvation? No. But they are all different angles. The quest for omnipresence, the quest for omnipotence, the quest for omniscience, all these omni words that you have to reach the all qualities of God. Now, some people really dream about it. Is it possible to be omnipresent? Could I be in the whole universe, just like Bhairava, like the consciousness of God? You know, how would that be? How would that feel? The quest, in the end, I would sum it up by calling it the quest of the absolute. Some people are searching for something which they cannot even call it by the name. They simply call it something absolute, something which cannot be described, something which cannot be compared, something which does not have any philosophical term of comparison, something which is absolute, which also in Vedanta, the term of Brahman is, is defining. That's why I told to you there are multiple motivations. You know why you are in a place like Agama. You know what your curiosity is. Are you trying to become endowed with paranormal powers? I'm happy. And if that gives you motivation, work for it. Work for it and cross that line between banality, between being a Mr. or Mrs. Nobody, and becoming something. And then, of course, they are higher, lower. You might be in this quest for meaning and for love and for enlightenment, you might simply be in a quest for improving the quality of your life because you feel you are alone, afraid, confused, and so many other things which are there. And at least yoga will take you to the next step. At least if you cannot swim across the ocean, swim until the first island. Swim until you find 
a solid ground. And you can say, at least here, you know, I decided that when I'm getting old, I'm going to Mother Teresa in Calcutta, and I help hungry children cooking food for they. You know, I want to be a charitable person, and I want for 10 years to do an activity coming out of love, coming out of self-sacrifice. I'm not saying it's a supreme solution in life. Ramakrishna did not try to give food to the orphan children. Not that he was against it, but Ramakrishna did not organize an orphanage to take care of hungry children because he thought that the real meaning of life for him, for his disciples, for his wife, was something more yogic, was something more esoteric, was something more metaphysical. But it doesn't say that Ramakrishna was looking down on people who were taking care of hungry children, because as I said, that's a holistic thing. It comes from some part of your evolution. It comes from some part of your subconscious mind. It is a facet of your Atman, which is being polished to perfection. It comes from the lords of the karma who have blessed you that in this life you may have this gift and that will be giving to you a certain satisfaction, a certain... Ramakrishna said, if I have to take care of children, he didn't say it, but in his mind he would have said, I will not be happy enough. It would be a good thing to do. It would be beautiful. So would it be to compose poetry. So would it be to paint wonderful paintings. No, but it would not be enough. I'm kind of longing for something more than that. And thus, here in yoga, in the holistic yoga, sometimes we are motivated by a cancer, which is just barking one meter behind our ass, and we have to do, 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 or else become ill and suffer. And sometimes we are motivated by the big pains of life, by our curiosity for the occult and esoteric, and lastly, why not, we are motivated by the quest of the fact that without doing something, without doing a spiritual effort, it looks like our life is going into a dead end. It's like in the end, nothing significant has been accomplished and we feel desperate. Not because the coffin in itself is scary. A person at this level doesn't maybe think that the coffin is scary. Maybe they think that the coffin is a liberation and moving to the next level. But it's still not enough. If you go to your coffin doing what Ramakrishna did or what Ramana Maharishi did, then you say, I have fulfilled, I have made a gigantic step. If I don't, yeah, at least I wrote a good book. And it's better than nothing. But a part of me says, it would have been better if I wrote 200, like Shivananda, you know? Then it would have been, because not many people wrote 200 books, and especially not 200 books, on the relevant issues, on issues of spirituality, health, yoga, and other such things. That's why I wanted to muse, to ponder with you tonight, why do yoga? Thinking is yoga for me? Of course, those who are already in, you partly know that there is something for you, but many people outside thinking that yoga is just some contortionist or some aerobics, no? they are wondering, but yoga, I shouldn't, I, maybe I should do, I don't know, Tibetan Buddhist. I don't want to speak against Tibetan Buddhist because I love Tibetan Buddhist. I have connections, spiritual connections with Tibetan Buddhist. I'm teaching fundamental practices from Tibetan yoga in our courses. But all in all, 
the full yoga science, the integral yoga, as Sri Aurobindo has called it, is the mother of all methods, is the method of all methods, is the synthesis of everything. And therefore, uh, for me, no, I would always say, you have some quest, either for health or for this or for that, no? then yoga definitely can help. There are very few places where yoga cannot help. I'm not going to absurdly say that yoga is everything because then there would be no more room for God. God is everything. The absolute is everything. Yoga is after all just a method invented and perfected on this planet by great people generations over generations developing branches and aspects of it but it's a wonderful thing i wish more and more people would know about yoga practice it get results and in the end of the day teach it pass it on to the next generations because it's a treasure of humanity not only of india i could speak so much about aspiration because aspiration is what moves us. If we don't have aspiration for at least healing our body, or if we don't have aspiration for at least uh, reaching a state of astral projection or something, we will not do it. We will not move it. It's, no, we are going to choose something else in life. But. When you identify your motivation, your grounds, your aspiration, then you know, those of you who have that, you know that yoga means something, it goes somewhere, and you feel like a pro it's worthy, and it's worthy also to be shared with other people. I think it's enough for tonight. I want you to meditate on where is your aspiration, where is your motivation, what things would make you stay up in the night or do this or do that, or not do this or not do that. No, because you need to find your ground, your roots there in the ground. The Tibetan yogis consider that that's the ground. It's like the roots, you start from there, that's what moves you. All your practice is built on that ground. Thank you all for joining tonight and thinking with me, resonating with me on these fundamental issues of our life and soul and hope to see you further in our activities here in Agama, sharing this wonderful path of yoga. <laughs>